You're supposed to do that on YouTube, by the way. Oh. You're supposed to say, hey. Hit like. If you guys don't mind, go ahead and hit that subscribe, the like button, blah, blah, blah. I don't, they call I don't that know what a you're supposed to do. Call to action. Call to action. Do it. Why don't you guys act? Do it. Anyway, you have to be, before it's too late because we're all about to die. That's what this is all about. We're, exactly. all, about, we're, we're all about to die. That's what I've been finding out from all the major oh. news outlets. Um, it's hot outside or something. It's hot, mm. and it's hot in the UK, uh, which never have, it's never been this hot before on, on record or in history or probably maybe, we think, mm. possibly, but it also has been. So but I don't know if you heard what I just said, but we need to give all of our money to the government so they can solve this problem. Mm. That's what I just said. Well, because we didn't have as much money back then where people were complaining about it then. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But now we do. This is the front page. This is the top portion of the Washington Post. Every single article is about the climate emergency, the hottest day on record. There's even this great article that we're going to have to save for Friday, which is visualizing Europe's heat wave with melting popsicles. <laughs> and yes, in each country, they show a time-lapse video of a popsicle melting. That's, Give the government more money. Yeah. That's it. Give the government more money. That'll, At least it's in gay colors. If, no, those are very in, you know, inclusive, inclusive and yeah. prideful. Mm-hmm popsicles okay so they're so, proud of the heat very proud of the popsicles at least i'm not sure okay. so the so britain sees the hottest day on record they even say with mercury set to rise further this is from the wapo as you can see there's plenty of content right there in the washington post today mm. didn't really have to go anywhere else but we do have a great article that michael burry posted last week about climate change michael burry if you don't know who that is he's most the big short Commonly known as the guy from the big short, although I am sure he is sick of that reference. If I was him, I would be sick of that reference because that's that's just how he's known, you know. Anyway. I would not be just repeating it in my head as I I'm mean, counting it's, the it's dollars. It made him a lot of money, so whatever. <laughs> okay, so Britain sees hottest day on record. Has it ever in human history been this hot in the British Isles? Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> if you want to mark an unnatural Scary, real-world data point for climate change that is here in Britain right now, which saw its hottest day on record Tuesday with temperatures hitting 40.2 Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit. It's an extreme weather episode, a freak peak heat not seen since modern record keeping began a century and a half ago. Is this like an M&M? Um, like an M&M wrap? Oh, yeah, maybe. It's I an don't extreme know. weather episode, a freak peak heat. <laughs> and probably, <laughs> at least it wasn't a Drake reference today. That's yeah. fine. Uh, see, you forgot about Drake. So you know who Eminem is then. That's I do, good. yeah. I have heard of him. I am white. And he didn't play on a TV show. He could have. Maybe. He was on 8 Mile. I That's saw him on that. That's a movie. Probably not since weather observation got serious here in 1659 and maybe far longer. <laughs> Surely no Briton alive now or his or her great or great great grandparents had felt 40 C without traveling abroad. Queen Victoria, William Shakespeare, Henry VIII, he was. They probably never faced down a 40 C day in Britain. This nation was not built to withstand such heat. Its homes, workplaces, roads, rails, hospitals, and infrastructure were constructed for temperate weather not this inferno. <laughs> and if you read, you re, you know, you read about infernos, you can even go like to the Bible. One of the be biggest references is like anything over 40 C. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what you had to look forward to. Now, it's hot. That's uh, 104. That's not cold. It's definitely not cold. Mm. Okay. The popsicles are melting over there in Britain, as mm. we'll see later in the week. Britain has some of the most extensive weather records in the world. All right, so trust their weather records. Here's how extensive they are. Logged via diaries, observation and instruments as far back as the Age of Enlightenment, including daily records archived since the 1770s, and monthly maximums and minimums dating back to the 1660s. Quote, we are absolutely confident we have not recorded a... F we have not recorded... A 40 C day going back to the mid 1850s. They are confident that they have not recorded 
a 40 C day going back mm. to the mid 1850s. Probably. Manager of the National Climate Information Center for the Met Office told the WAPO, referring to the beginning of the Weather Services Instrument Measured Temperature Records. So they know that since they started using their thermometers, they have not recorded that. Alexander Farnsworth, a paleoclimatologist at the University of Bristol, was willing to travel back further in time. So we just went to the 1850s. He says, quote, there is no direct evidence that the UK has exceeded 40 C in the past 6,000 or so years, he told the Washington Post. Mm. Which is a really long time. No direct evidence. Yeah. So lack of measurement tools, that's not enough. But you just say there's no direct evidence. Now, could they accurately measure what the temperature was and were they keeping accurate records at that time? No. But the most important part is that there's no direct evidence that it was ever over 40 C, just so you know. With mm. caveats. He did say, with caveats, he warned. Mm. To go deep in the prehistory, before instrument data, scientists must rely on proxies that tell them average temperatures over long periods of time. And then they make shit up after that. (laughs) Looking at lake and marine sediments, ice cores, corals, glaciation, bugs in bogs, tree rings, and such, to estimate past climate. Bugs in bogs! (laughs) So just so you know, all that, those are estimates to estimate, the, but they've definitely estimated to within like 1C for sure. They know, mm-hmm. they know that. Mm-hmm. Over the past 2,000 years, it did get warmer in Britain during the medieval warm period between 750 and 1350, but probably not as hot as right now most scientists say. I love the way they wrote this. This is the way you can say anything you want. You just have to put some little qualifying mm. descriptive words in there. Yeah. Probably and most and maybe occur in like every other paragraph in this paragraph, I think. And who knows? <laughs> but this is what we think. Okay, to go. Okay, over the past. No, the medieval doomsday book completed in 1086 as a kind of census tallied 45 vineyards in Britain. So it was warm enough to grow grapevines. They know that that's how they're getting some of their temperature data, by the way. They talked about vineyards that were in Britain, and they know the temperatures that are required to grow the grapevines. And so they that's how they're getting some temperature. As far north as York. As far, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just didn't say it because I don't, it doesn't mean anything to me. It's like but, n- northern Britain. Um, that's Is that so old you, York? You remember, you remember Braveheart. I've watched it one time. That's not, I mean, it was Yorkshire in the movie. It's not. Like the terrier? Yes, exactly. Good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Then there was. tiny teacup things. That's why they call them teacups, too. Britain. (laughs) Then then there was a little ice age from 1300 to 1850 when the Northern Hemisphere grew colder again. This warming and cooling was not caused by human emissions of greenhouse gases as today but by the subtle tilt and wobble of the planet as it faced the sun. Oh, weird. <laughs> I just lo- I just love it, you know. Seven, eight hundred years ago, that was caused by the subtle tilt of the wobble of the planet and, you know, the sun. Not like today, where it's clearly people. Mm-hmm. Charlie, do you want to say our weekly disclaimer about climate change, just for all the new listeners that are listening today? Oh, I mean, I... I like the Elon Musk approach, which is, I mean, we do have to account for uh, the way he explained it is we are taking carbon, like solid or liquid carbon, out of the ground, and then it does vaporize into the air. So there has to be something to account for that. However, how much effect can we actually have? Like, how even if we took all the carbon out of the ground, which I don't even know if we could, because remember back in the day, Nate, when we were going to run out of oil, mm-hmm. um, but then they find now we found like billions of barrels that we still can't get to anyway. So even if we took all of the carbon out of the ground and then we released in the atmosphere, how much of an effect would that actually have on our weather? The, th- the truth of the matter is we don't know, um, but it's not like we should continue to do something like that. So I am for the market innovating uh, in reducing our carbon emissions for the sheer fact that eventually 
it can't be great for us to take all the carbon out of the ground and put it into the air. We need to just find it wants to be in the ground. We need to just find the clip of him saying that and put it on a button on the board, because Mm -hmm. I feel like we do go through the Elon Musk description of climate change. And that really did change both of our mindsets on the whole idea, along with some other great books uh, from that we can put links to in the show notes that I'll forget to do, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do it right now. Also, uh, from the conservatives, um, what is that conservatives, uh, coalition for climate? The Conservation Coalition, yes. something like that. Yeah. Um, Great resource. The IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Well, repre- this is a terrible resource. <laughs> representing the authoritative consensus of world scientists reported in 2021 that overall and on average, Earth is now warmer than it has been in 125,000 years. Now, Just to preface one more time, we've got about 140 years of accurate temperature data. Past that, we're looking at rings on trees. um, Grapevines. Whether or not there were grapes. (laughs) Oh, the grape measurement, yeah, for climate. Yeah, that's one of the big things. And various other ways of estimating uh, what the temperature was. Now, I... I don't doubt that you can get an estimation of what the temperature was based on the growth of the ice or the growth of the tree or whatever, but can you get it to within a degree? That's what I want to know. Within one degree. No, you can make an, um, it's a more educated guess. Yeah. But we have no idea. Some experts in paleoclimate studies say it's possible that to top 21st century heat in Britain, you would have to go back to the Miocene climatic optimum about 15 million years ago, when the world looked... Okay, so they are saying, by the way, once again in this article, they're saying that Earth is warmer than it has been in the 125,000 years. That's in the previous paragraph. So 125,000 years ago, it was warmer. All right? It wasn't because of people. So that's one thing. Well, we don't know what kind of cars people had back that's then. That's true. That's true. They mm-hmm. could have all been destroyed. We just haven't found the remnants of them yet. We've been here for 4.8 billion years. I don't know how many times 125,000 goes into 4.8 billion, but I'm guessing it's something like 2,000 or 3,000 times. I don't know. Just a random guess off the top of my head, but somewhere in there, uh, every 125,000 years. And then they're saying about 15 million years ago when the world looked quite unlike today. And so they are still saying that the earth has been hotter than what it is right now. That's always the problem with these arguments. Back then, the continents were bumping around. They were different seas and mountain ranges. There were mammals, but no humans. Miles Allen. We think. Probably. <laughs> we think maybe. Miles Island, Allen, a professional. I can't read. A professor. He's a professional professor. A professional geoscience professor at the <laughs> University of Professional Oxford Professors of Geoscience suggested caution. He said it was clear that from the 1850s onward, there's never been a day at 40 C. But the further one looks back in time, the fuzzier the picture may be. One remarkable thing, this is about to get real fun here in a second, by the way. One remarkable thing, Alan said, is how accurate climate models have become, both at forecasting the future and looking forward, backward in time. Researchers at the Met Office have reported that in the natural climate of the pre-industrial world, there might be one day in every 7,000 years that Britain could face 40 C. One day in every 7,000 years. Holy Mm. crap, that almost never happens. Wow. In fact, 1350 was about 7,000 years ago. So, um, 700 years ago. That's 700. Now, that is an average, by the way, one in every 7,000 years. Here's the problem with 7,000 years. That's a long time. That's a really long time. This Mm. hardly ever happens. We've been here for 4.8 billion years, so that could have happened 685,714 times. It would have been over 40 C. 40 C or above. Or above is how many times 7,000 goes into 4.8 billion years. Simon Lee, an atmospheric scientist at Columbia University, who was born and raised in North Yorkshire. It still is Yorkshire. There you go. Wrote on his blog that the idea of 40C was seemingly unthinkable temperature. Which is scientific. For a country with an aging population. Now, this is a seemingly unthinkable temperature that the previous paragraph said has happened probably 685,000 times throughout Earth's history. This is seemingly unthinkable uh, for a population that does not have widespread residential air conditioning. Now, 
I've got a remedy for that. Could get air conditioning. It's been around for it's a, a good while now. Now, it's a right in the United States. <laughs> okay, you got a right to air conditioning. Mm. How is it that they don't have a right to air conditioning? Just give everyone air conditioning. They've got plenty of money. Everything's free. No problem. Everything's perfect over there. Air units for everyone. That's what I would recommend. Mm. There are little things like that that we can do to adapt, you know, so people don't die when it does get really hot. Here's a great, uh, here's a great representation of not adapting to the climate. Uh, by the way, this picture, you'd have to go to YouTube to see or be in a live group via joingmail.com. Here's, a, here's someone giving one of the guards outside of the palace some water because it's really hot outside. And that's nice of that guy to do that, of course. But here's just not adapting to the situation. He's still wearing this 19-foot-tall fuzzy black hat <laughs> and his wool, wool <laughs> costume <laughs> like it's freaking 1723. Right, out, right there outside the palace, just full of people that are still just living off of people's tax money and, mm -hmm. and slave holdings and world domination that went on for quite a long time. I don't know. Maybe take the freaking hat off, man. Can we just take the hat off? Yeah. I'm just saying, you know, you're, a lot of heat comes from your head and you trap that stuff in. You know, you ever wear a hat on a hot day, you take it off and you're like, oh. With, I believe, uh, this is something from the live group, uh, I believe it's bear skin. Mm. Like bear fur. Okay. Those things hibernate. You I, can't tell in the picture, but he's got... <laughs> <laughs> he's got... There's other things happening in the background. Yeah. And we're so proud of him. Hannah, Hannah Cloak. <laughs> Hannah Cloak, a natural hazards researcher at the University of Reading, told the Post that it's unprecedented, this kind of forecast, where we might feel something we've never experienced here before. Okay, so in this paragraph, we say it's unprecedented. The previous one, we say it's seemingly unthinkable. The paragraph before that, we say it's happened 685,714 times throughout Earth's history. As an estimation. Maybe. Maybe. Just to be clear. It's all maybe. Just so everyone knows. Yeah. All right. So why are we talking about this? I don't care if it's hot in Europe, right? That's what you guys are all thinking. Well... Wait, just wait. There's, yeah. There's more. Mm -hmm. but, and and just to give you, I, I like what you did here. But the, the easiest way to think about this is more of a time scope. So. Oh, I forgot about that. As Nate said, the earth has been here for 4.8 billion years. So if you think about that, roughly a minute, like right at a minute represents one year. So if you say a minute equals a year. Mm -hmm. So, so far we have experienced long as humans have been alive, 9,100 years. Not humans. That's entire Earth's oh, history. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Entire Earth's history is 9,100 years of climate, which is like a minute. Just, okay. Uh, we have fairly accurate climate data from a little over two hours ago. Yeah. So if you, so if if you think you, about it in time. If a minute equals a year, then we have 9,100 years worth of climate data for the Earth. Not data. We have 9,100 years worth of climate for the Earth. And we've got data from about two hours ago. Mm -hmm. And we're judging everything based off of the data we've collected over the past two hours. And what's going to happen? Now, I can't even do that on a stock. Let me see. The Nasdaq's up 2.5% today. I think that means it's going to go to a trillion from what I can tell. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Mm -mm. Stuff goes back and forth. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to the Michael Burry uh, article post that he posted. But why does this matter to us, Charles? Well, because we have the fearless leader. Mm. This also from the WAPO. You know why he's fearless? Because he has no clue what's going on. It's, I envy him, honestly. Yeah. And it's like a guy with Alzheimer's walking around in the burning yeah. building. Could you imagine just like not having a clue? Mm-hmm. And you're the most important guy in the world. I love, you're like, oh, these people love me and some hate. But you know what? I'm just taking it a day at a time. Ben Shapiro always calls Biden the happiest person on earth because every day he wakes up and finds out that he's president. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I've always what? thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> All right. From the WAPO, Biden could declare climate emergency as soon as this week, sources say. Now, this is why this is always a big deal and why we should never give the government these type of emergency powers. We experienced during COVID, now what's going to happen here? 
Biden is considering declaring the national climate emergency as soon as this week as he seeks to salvage his environmental agenda in the wake of stalled talks on Capitol Hill, according to three people familiar with the matter. If an emergency is invoked, it could empower the Biden administration in its efforts to reduce carbon emissions and foster cleaner energy. Two of the individuals with knowledge of the discussion said they also uh, expect the president to announce a slew of additional actions aimed at curbing climate uh, uh, curbing planet warming emissions. The president had uh, has made clear that if the Senate doesn't act to tackle the climate crisis and strengthen our domestic clean energy industry, he will. He's got a pen and a phone, you know. Yeah, this is uh, that's a quote from a White House official. Uh, we are considering all options, and no decision has been made. Jared Bernstein, is that Bernstein or Bernstein? I- I would say Stein, but who knows anymore? Which is a top White House economic advisor. So this economic advisor is at the top. Okay. They're not getting this quote from a lowly bottom feeder <clears throat> economic not, advisor. Not a bottom economic advisor. He's top. Yeah. Uh, this person says, quote, I think realistically there is a lot he can do and there is a lot he will do. Uh, now, the good news is that we had the... Was it West Virginia win a case against the EPA? Yeah, they just they mentioned that later in the article. We did just so, have the Supreme Court saying that there are limits to what the EPA can do, and, but we'll we'll see what kind of things we can do through executive orders through the CDC. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> they can definitely they can. They used it for for eviction moratoriums. They sure did. And we talked about this, by the way. We talked about how they were going to eventually use the same stuff they used for COVID to fight climate change. Mm-hmm. And how dangerous it's all going to be. That is what they do. Top top A's to Biden are debating the best course of action as another pushing heat wave has descended this week on the central United States. And as a similar weather pattern is breaking temperature records across Europe, many Democrats have called on the White House in recent days to use its powers to address global warming as hopes for congressional action have faded. Quote, this is an important moment. There is probably nothing more important for our nation and our world than for the United States to drive a bold, energetic transition in its energy economy from fossil fuels to renewable energy. That's coming from Senator Jeff Malarkey. Now, if there's any, that's what he's full of. If there's anyone that I trust to transition like the entire world's energy over to something better and more efficient and cleaner, it's the this presidential administration that we have right now. Not only the United States government, the, but this even just this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, some, uh, some climate activists have urged the White House in recent months to deploy an emergency declaration to maximum effect, arguing that it would allow the president to halt crude oil expert exports, limit oil and gas drilling in federal waters, and direct agencies, including the Federal Emergency Management Agency, that's FEMA, to boost renewable energy sources. What a great idea. That's exactly what we need right now. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. What, why won't you take all of your profits, Mr. Oil Man, and dump them back into your business? Why won't you do it, Mr. Oil Company, you're, you greedy SOB? Mm-hmm. You're just trying to save money for yourself. Take all of your windfall profits and put them back into the future of your oil company. Why won't they do it, Charlie? That we're going to halt. Jeez. <laughs> Any new executive action on climate could face a formidable court challenge, which would affect the future of environmental regulations. Last month, the Supreme Court cut back the federal government's powers to regulate power plants, carbon emissions. Initially, Democrats had hoped to invest more than $500 billion that we don't have in new programs to cut emissions and support new technologies, including electric vehicles, before Manchin raised objections to the Build Back, Do Better, Gooder Act. Now, what you can tell is since they haven't put in that $500 billion, we hardly have any companies coming up with electric vehicles, like hardly any of them. Mm-mm. You you got Tesla, who's got a clear monopoly on the EV sector right now. I heard earlier they got 70% of the EV market. They control. And it, without that $500 billion. No, they're not the leaders of the EV market. We know that GM. No, they're not leading the we way. We know, yeah, at GM all. is leading it. But they're the mar- they have the highest market share for some reason, which is a monopoly. It's a gr- it's definitely a monopoly. Mm-hmm. 
that's a great example of something that is a monopoly is when you just have 70% of a of any given sector. Mm-hmm. Not the fact that you could prevent other people from coming yeah. into that market because clearly Tesla has prevented other companies from creating electric vehicles. Yeah, mono typically translated to like one like just single. Yeah. But now it's Well, that was the white supremacist like patriarchal yeah. definition of mono. Now it's just greater than I think 22%, something like that. Yeah, we're on the post-monopoly definition Mm -hmm. now, which is any amount that you could possibly have. Yeah. Like your monogamous relationship, obviously, there's at least 10 people in it. Uh, However many you want. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Quote. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm sorry. Senator Ron Wyden, um, which, by the way, I did like his questioning when it came to privacy stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But... He's gone um, kind of crazy. He's gone woke. Yeah. He's the leader of the tax-focused Senate Finance Committee, Committee said in a statement Monday that lawmakers at least should explore renewing tax credits that boost cleaner technology. Quote, while I strongly support additional executive action by President Biden, we know a flood of Republican lawsuits will follow. Legislation continues to be the best option here. The climate crisis is the issue of our time, and we should keep our options open. So... Now we have to do this because this is an emergency. We're all about to die. Mm-hmm. That's from uh, from what we can tell. All the data right now is pointing that we're all going to die. Well, and these um, scientists that we should be able to trust. By well, the yeah. way, I mean you can't question mm-hmm. science except for those sexist scientists that we learned about on Don't Believe of the Week on Friday. The biologists, because science is uh, sexist yeah, those... itself. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, and... we learned about it during abortion too. Those. Biologists mm-hmm. and, and embryologists, those aren't real scientists determining when life begins. That's crazy. If you're going to take away a woman's right to choose, a woman's right to choose based on science, well, that science doesn't exist, but this science does. Here's a picture from London, by the way. 18, 19 July, extreme heat, only travel if essential. I've heard that word before. Now, that's not a decree coming from that palace that's got the guy with the giant fur cap this is just a a suggestion currently currently it's a suggestion not in australia but that wording (laughs) right there only travel if essential because of extreme heat i guarantee you not going to be the last time you hear the word essential associated with climate change and your ability to travel or have uh commence uh, Commerce with people, anything like that. I don't, I don't understand how people like in Arizona or, or you know, Nevada do it. Mexico. Well, they're it, so that's the adaptation part that we talked about. That's one of the things that these they don't great, have AC in Mexico. That's one thing that these, I mean, they do in some places. But. These great books cover is people adapt to things. Like there's a big problem in Europe, and the problem is they have been in cooler temperatures for a long time, so they don't all have air conditioning. Like it would be tough to go through and find a house in Tennessee unless it's someone who's extremely, extremely impoverished that doesn't have some type of air conditioning, whether it's a window unit or central AC or whatever. But it wouldn't be that uncommon to find that uh, when you go up there in North Yorkshire, mm-hmm. something like that. So they could fix that by like doing AC. And you fans. Know. F- fans. I noticed, so in our new ho- in our new community... We moved, by the way, to a new house, and uh, we built a house, and we were going, uh, as they were building others, we were walking in to see the things people had chosen. Now, most of my neighbors are from California, San Diego to be exact, where the weather is a beautiful 70 to 80 degrees all the time, and you have the nice breeze blowing from the ocean, the cool Pacific bringing in those cooler winds, and I can tell you, almost none of my neighbors got any fans in their house. Every bedroom has like a chandelier or like a cool light fixture or whatever, which is nice. Um, but I was like, you're clearly not from the South. Ceiling fans it's, are not not everywhere, but we've all grown up with them. We've grown up, yeah. Let us know in the group if it's common in your area to have a ceiling fan in every room like it is here. Just let, let us know. I'm, I'm curious about that. So anyway, Michael Burry, famous for the big short tweeted out. I've actually got uh, notifications on his tweets now because they're normally pretty good and he deletes them often uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to follow them. So he posted this article from the, uh, let me see, CEI. What does that stand for? I can't remember anymore. 
Let me pull uh, that up. Yeah, I don't remember. Competitive either. Enterprise Institute is what that is. Competitive Enterprise Institute. And it's all Which these... Which is obviously greedy capitalism. Yes. But... All these failed climate predictions over the last 50 years. And he said, I grew up with the Ice Age, acid rain, overpopulation, and global famine, and a giant hole in the ozone caused by Aquanet, all to wipe us out shortly if we did not change drastically and fast. So it is hot in July. He always says something weird at the end of it. And then we, we get this. So let's go through this article just a little bit. And I actually wanted to just pull this pull this up on the screen. And Charles and I can kind of run through this. We've both seen this. This is a very interesting thing. I actually scrolled through the whole thing the first time I saw it. Found it pretty cool. But from CEI, wrong again, 50 years of failed eco-apocalyptic predictions. I see, I see what they did there. It's pretty, yeah. it's, it's pretty good. Modern doomsdayers have been predicting climate and environmental disasters since the 1960s. They continue to do so today. None of the apocalyptic predictions with due dates as of today have come true. What follows is a collection of notably wild predictions from notable people in government and science. More than merely spotlighting the failed predictions, this collection shows the makers of failed apocalyptic predictions often are individuals holding respective positions in government and science. So we're still dealing with this today, and the point that they're making is this has always been the case, that we're dealing with these crazy predictions all the time. Eventually, and maybe eventually they'll be right. Maybe just maybe we shouldn't be making brash decisions like and declaring emergencies, economy destroying decisions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Much like we did during COVID, which we talked to you about. Yeah. It's like, uh, look, this may be dangerous. That's possible. Okay. Like let's, let's give the devil its due, so to speak. All right. And let's like, look at this thing, but to, to rush in and be like, this is the only way humans can die is by the earth heating up. This is the only way that's going to destroy humans. That's not true. Like if we kill everyone on the way to solving this problem, did we actually solve the problem? No, no, we did not. This is, this goes back to my discussion a couple of weeks ago, which is why you should listen to the podcast every single day where I talked about how I think people are too narrowly focused and we don't get enough experts in the room to talk about, different types of things. Like, have they asked any like reputable economists what doing something like this would do to the economy to solve the climate change problem? Because apparently humans can't handle 104 degree heat. Well, they're reputable to them. They're credible scientists to them. You know, it all depends on what your views are, whether or not you're reputable. <laughs> Of course, whether or not you line up with the people that are in power. I just, I want to see the round tables like we had at Free to Choose, you know? We had multiple people from multiple different backgrounds, all, you know, speaking their ideas, and then somebody gets to make a decision from that after every idea has been presented. So this is from 1967, already too late. Quote, it's already too late in 1967. Dire famine forecast by 1975 from the Salt Lake Tribune. Which would have saved us from the Y2K bug. Yeah. So. Of course. It is already too late for the world to avoid a long period of famine. A Stanford University uh, biologist said Thursday, this is from Paul Ehrlich. He said, the time of famines is upon us and will be at its worst and most disastrous by 1975. Yes. Now, who is Paul Ehrlich? Never heard of him before. Weird. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It's not like we've heard anything from him in the past few years. No. Um, at all. Now, you might also notice his name pop up in a few of these. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> he, okay, he said the population of the United States is already too big in 1967. Birth control may have to be accomplished by making it involuntary and by putting sterilizing agents into staple foods and drinking water and that the Roman Catholic Church should be pressured into going along with routine measures of population control. Jesus. In 1967. All right, I'll do another one here. From, I like how uh, these people can just say these things it's, and without you, any backlash. You can say this. He's been saying this since 1967, starting off with the earliest one, and still someone that people will listen to right now. It doesn't matter how, how often yeah. you've been wrong. And we'll ban Alex Jones, but then this guy's mainstream. <laughs> What's he doing these days? Mm. Let's figure that out.
I don't know. We figured that out while I'm reading this one. The next one one is from the New York Times. This is in 1969. Foe of pollution sees lack of time. Uh, This is uh, from Palo Alto, California. The trouble with almost all environmental problems, says, oh, Paul Ehrlich. Weird. The population biologist is, quote, that by the time we have enough evidence to convince people, you're dead. We must realize that unless we are extremely lucky, everybody will disappear in a cloud of blue steam in 20 years. Jesus. New York Times, 1969. Unless we're... Blue steam. I guess it turns out we're extremely lucky. So so that's good. I didn't realize how lucky Mm. we were. Um, Let's see. From 1970, Ice Age by the year 2000 from the Boston Globe. Scientist predicts a new Ice Age by the 21st century. <clears throat> Air pollution may obliterate the sun and cause a new ice age in the first third of the next century. The demand for cooling water will boil dry the entire flow of the rivers and streams of the continental United States. Ooh. And a bunch of other stuff in this article, Boston Globe, 1970. Uh, here's another one. I didn't see who that one was from. Does it give any quotes? James in here? P. Lodge Jr. Okay. So. Well, I'm sure Ehrlich agreed with him. I'm sure. All right. This is from 1970 as well. Um, This is by a guy, uh, um, Dr. Oh, Ehrlich. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. He's an outspoken ecologist. Um, He says, uh, giving aspirins to cancer victims is what Dr. Paul Ehrlich thinks of current proposals for pollution control. No real uh, action has been taken to save the environment he maintains, and it does need saving. Ehrlich predicts that the oceans will be as dead as Lake Erie in less than a decade. In less, less, less than a decade. America will be subject to water rationing by 1974 and food rationing by 1980. So, you guys. By the way, he's still, this, this guy is, still has a job doing the same thing, and he stands by all of his predictions. Just that reading, I've, yeah, I'm just reading in Wikipedia. How right here? Can you stand by? Yep. As your predictions come out to be not true. <laughs> like if this is he on Twitter? I don't know if he is God, or not. We should find his Twitter. 1971, new ice age is coming. At right. least they're sticking to the ice age thing in the 70s. Here. Dr. S. I. Rasul, the National Aeronautics Center from NASA and Columbia University, said in the next 50 years. When was this? 1971. Okay. In the next 50 years, the fine dust man constantly puts into the atmosphere by fossil fuel burning could screen out so much sunlight that the average temperature could drop by six degrees. If sustained over several years, he estimated such a temperature decrease could be sufficient to trigger an ice age exclamation point from the Washington Post in Mm. 1971. So at that time, the fuel burning made, made the earth cooler. They're right um, this time, though. This time, they're right, for sure. Mm-hmm. It's not that the climate just, like, shifts or anything. Right. I don't know. All right, next one from uh, Brown University. This was uh, 1972, a letter to the president. Um, and let's see. Well, I'll have to scroll to the bottom and see who wrote this letter. Um, the main conclusion of the meeting was that a global deterioration deterioration of climate by order of magnitude larger than any hitherto experienced by civilized mankind. It is a very real possibility and indeed may be due very soon. Ice Age by 2070, they said. This is, uh, with best regards, George Kula, who's the Lamont... uh, Kukla. Oh, sorry, Kukla, who is the Lamont Daughtry Geological Observatory. 1974, new ice age coming fast. Space satellites show new ice age coming fast. It happens that blocking, I can't read that. It's kind of, uh, I can't, it's kind of blurred out there. Yeah. Play an important role in the characteristics of weather in the Northern Hemisphere and account for some adverse changes in our own climate. Once again, new ice age coming fast from this article from Time, 1974. I'll just do two here. Another ice age from 1974 on my birthday in 1974. Geez. 
The telltale signs are everywhere, from the unexpected persistence and thickness of pack ice in the waters around Iceland to the southward migration of a warmth-loving creature like the armadillo from the Midwest. Mm. We're going to be going to a new ice ice age. (laughs) My (laughs) tongue was frozen uh, reading that so much. This is Mike Tyson, that. (laughs) Ice age. 1974, now we're on to the ozone depletion uh, as a great peril to life. The great peril to life. Gas pairs away Earth's ozone. And so there's just a big article about that. And by the way, we're still sitting around uh, actually a lot higher levels than when they were predicting that that was all going to happen. And of course, that's what the problem is right now. Well, that was the great work done by them banning those aerosol cans named. Well, that's true. Mm. Although you can still get Aquanet on the Aquanet heavy on the black market. (laughs) From what I can tell. In 1976, we're still in the great cooling period here. Um, So writes Stephen Schneider, a young climatologist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. That's the the one that's still around, by the way. Uh, Right? It's the NACC something. Uh, In Boulder, Colorado, reflecting the consensus of the climatological community in his new book, The Genesis uh, Strategy. His warning that present world food reserves are an insufficient hedge against future famines has been heard among the scientific community for years. For example, it was a conclusion of the 1975 National Academy of Sciences report, uh, but Schneider has decided to explain the entire problem as... as Nate keeps scrolling, Sorry, and I can't read. You can't read as fast as I'm scrolling. scrolling. No, it's because I'm not doing the scrolling, so my brain isn't connected. That's true. Yeah. In 1974, Schneider and Bryson tried to explain to a White House policymaking group why conditions are likely to worsen. One of the most depressing anecdotes in the book is Schneider's description of the deaf deaf ear their warnings received. So that's why we can't. Now we get on to acid rain in 1980. And this piece here about how acid rain is going to kill all of us, that's one thing that Michael Burry mentioned. You know, so which they were probably taking acid when they wrote this. Let's just do these two. Th- so acid rain kills life in lakes. And by the way, we're all going to be dying 10 years later. Uh, the same people here. Acid rain. No environmental crisis study concludes. From so the they got a study AP. for 10 years, <laughs> 10 years. It's going to kill us all. We do a study 10 years later. No environmental crisis study concludes in the Associated Press. But thanks for letting us do the study. <laughs> But thank you for the money for the study. We surely do appreciate you. 1978, no end in sight to a 30-year cooling trend. No end in sight? Wow. That's crazy. What about the fact that that was basically the end that was in sight when that article came out? (laughs) That's weird. No end in sight, by the way, happened at the end of the 30-year cooling trend. That was a really funny part. Mm. The the exact time that 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 was... Pretty awesome. Okay. Miami News, more droughts likely, expert tells senators. So 1988. More droughts, by the way. Right now we're talking about flooding, but then we also talk about droughts Mm. all the time. Let's move through here a little bit. By the way, the precipitation. He said more droughts likely, expert tells senator. And uh, let me zoom in. This was a funny one, actually. He basically said that we might have just had the wettest year that's just going to get drier from here on out. And that was the prediction Mm. from what he told them. Now, the time that that one came out was the driest year since that time. It had not, has not been drier than the time that this person said it's only going to get drier from here on out. And we've had our wettest year. 1988. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Pretty good. Now we're, oh, now it's getting hot. Okay. From the 70s to the 80s. How about that? Uh, December 12th of 1988, prepare for long, hot summers. If you liked last summer's record temperatures, you're going to love the 1990s, says James Hansen. Uh, Washington, D.C., for instance, would go from its current 35 days a year over 90 degrees to 85 days a year. The level of oceans will rise anywhere from one to six feet. Boom, that's going to happen. Oh, Uh, By the way, since that forecast date, they haven't had more than that many days a year over over 90. As of 2019. He said they were going to more than double. And so, yeah, up to 2017, that was actually the the peak 
of the amount of days they mm-hmm. had temperatures over 90. And also, it looks like back in 1950-something, they had almost 100 days <laughs> Yeah, over 90. It's, it's definitely yeah. definitely all of us. Oh. Not, we need to... We need to be like meteorologists or in climate studies or something. Yeah, it's pretty easy. It doesn't mean anything. You just type words. Oh, this is a good one, too. Is this, 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 this when the salon first started? I guess so. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, let's see. While doing research 12 or 13 years ago, I met Jim Hansen. Let's see. This is from 1989. New York City's West Side Highway will be underwater by 2019. So Jim Hansen, the scientist, in 1988 predicted the greenhouse effect before Congress. I went over to the window, looked out the Broadway in New York City, and I said, if what you're saying about the greenhouse effect is true, is anything going to look different down there in 20 years? And he said, the West Side Highway will be underwater in 20 years. I haven't seen any recent photos, but I haven't heard anything about it. He said, you'll have signs. In restaurants, saying water by request only. Now, this is by 2019. Mm -hmm. Now, he was wrong about his previous prediction that we had just gone over there earlier. And now here's another one from him saying you'll have signs in restaurants saying water by request only within 20 or 30 years. And remember, we had this conversation in 98 or 1989. Does he still believe these things? Yes, he still believes everything. This person talked to him a few months ago and he said he wouldn't change anything that he said. Because it's a religion. That's why. That's actually why. Now, this was a funny part right here, and then we can, we don't have to, God, they just keep going. This this article, I'm going to make sure that this will be in the show notes. This is an amazing resource of really dumb articles about terrible things to come. And we'll add likely way more into those here in the next 20 years. But here's the climate model failure. Now, likely coming through on the green screen for the live people, this is a little bit messed up. But here are what all of the climate models, all of them, 102 climate models, they predicted for the average temperature through here. I didn't realize it was that late, Chuck. Here are the average of all the climate models, all the way up there. And here is the actual climate that we had experienced so far to that date. Um, well under all of them, basically just running flat, maybe drifting up just a little bit. So what did we learn from all of this stuff that we just went through? We're all going to die. Everything that they're saying right now is correct. They've got it all figured out. They are completely objective. They, they, They have questioned themselves and asked themselves whether or not it is possible for them to be wrong. And they have admitted their mistakes. And they have now figured everything out about the climate. And so we have to take them very seriously this time. That's what I learned. I don't know about you guys, but that's definitely what I learned from all of these articles. Once again, I will put that in the show notes. I didn't realize it was already 1 p.m., but here's the deal. I do think that the climate is changing. Now, we don't know exactly why that is happening. Does it have anything to do with the fact that we take carbon from the ground and put it up into the atmosphere? I'm sure that there's an imbalance that could occur if you do it too fast. Sure, you do too much of it too fast. Why wouldn't that affect anything? There's also other things that can affect that. I'm going to put a link to a study. I'm going to put a link to a study in the show notes. And you can read it. I read through it earlier today, but it has to do with the effect of the sun on our climate, sunspots, solar flares, solar wind, all of that stuff. Now, I'm not out here saying that that is what has to do with everything. But it turns out this specific study, which was done in 2014, said that there needs to be much more of this data accounted for in our climate model predictions that is not accounted for in the way it should be. And that actually all of our temperature increases and decreases tended to correspond with the increases and decreases with solar flares and all of that that was going on. And the only reason I thought to talk about that, just mention it, I'm not going to go through the study today, but the only reason I thought to mention it, because I saw astronaut Scott Kelly post about this a few hours ago. He said, a major solar storm will hit Earth today and may cause disruptions to radio communications and GPS, according to NASA. Let's hope for a little aurora in the northern latitudes may be visible in northern U.S. states. So I was like, huh, 
What are the odds that he'd be posting about this massive solar storm that could be causing problems and we're talking about record heat at the same time? I'm not saying that that's the cause, all right? I'm not a scientist, all right? Take this as speculation, but read into the study that I'm going to link to in the show notes. It's very, very interesting. Anyway, if you enjoyed today's show, share it with a friend, a family member, and the children, of course. Hit like hit subscribe, do all those things if you think people need to hear what we have to say on a daily basis, every single day of the week, when we want to. Leave a comment, a rating, and review, all that stuff. You guys have broken the TikTok algorithm. We are coming back, and we thank you for that, but keep at it. All right, go to our TikTok and hit like, comment on something, share it. That way the Chinese government can spy on every single part of your life, uh, even probably things that you don't know. All right, so it's very important that you do that by downloading the TikTok app. Anyway, if you do all of those things, then we will be right back here again tomorrow. I think today's Tuesday, so tomorrow is Wednesday, last time I checked. Until then, have a good day and a good morning. Liberty!